God gave the Christian church a great commission to reach the world with the good news. But often, people in the church are hindered from this vital mandate. Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve concludes his series called Foundations, exploring the power and the protection that we have in Christ to prevail in this battle between the church and the gates of hell. man was on a desert island all by himself. One day he sees a ship out in the ocean there, and uh, he sends up a smoke signal, and the ship sees it was a Navy ship, and the Navy ship sees the smoke, and they, the Navy ship comes to this de deserted little island, and they find this man, and they said, wow, uh, how long have you been here? He said, I have been shipwrecked on this island alone for five years. And they said, wow, that's a long time. You're alone? He said, I'm alone. And they said, well, we see three huts there. He said, well, yeah. He said, the first hut is where I live. They said, well, yeah, well, what about the second one? He said, well, the second one's where I go to church. They said, well, what about the third one? He said, oh, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> we want to talk today about the church. Some people get upset at church and go to another church, obviously. We're in a series, and we're finishing the series today called Foundations. And today we want to talk about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church was born on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Lord came down in the Holy Spirit and He indwelt believers, 120 believers, and on the day of Pentecost, in one day, the church grew by 3,000 as Peter preached, and 3,000 souls were saved. And since the birth of the church nearly 2,000 years ago, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been attacked from without and attacked from within. The church has faced persecution, and it's faced theological perversion. It's faced opposition and oppression, yet the church of the Lord Jesus Christ continues to stand strong. Now, it's amazing when you think about the history and the things that have happened uh, in religious history, that the church is still standing, but it is, and it will always be standing. Now, we live in a world where things are rapidly changing. You notice that? I mean, they're just they're changing so quickly, it's hard to keep up. I mean, it, you know, I thought I was doing pretty good to be on Facebook, and then the kids are like, Facebook? Who does that? They do Snapchat and Instagram and MySpace. No, they don't, they don't really do that. That was, that was before. But, but everything's just changing so quickly. I can't keep up with that. And, and maybe you're one that you say, you know, uh, I get a little nervous about life because life is going so fast and it's changing so fast. And the things I thought were secure are not very secure. And it used to be some 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people would work at a job and they'd stay at a job and they'd stay at a job from the time they were uh, 25 until the time they retired at 65 or whatever. And now that it doesn't work like that anymore. It used to be in sports. I'm a sports guy, and I, I love the fact that when I was a kid growing up, that, that players were attached to teams and they played on those teams pretty much their whole career. And you could attach yourself to a professional team because you knew the players, and now it's hard to know the players because they move around all the time. They're are just very few things that are stable, really nothing stable in life except the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. The song says, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking 
sand. We're going to talk today about Christ and his church, the solid rock that stands. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has taken the disciples about 25 miles to the north for a little R&R. They've been preaching and teaching and working and doing ministry now for about two and a half years, and he takes them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. The uh, Philip, Herod Philip was the, the ruler there in Caesarea Philippi, way up north, and um, that place was a place of idol worship. It was a place where they worshiped the Baals, and then they came in and worshiped the god Pan, the Greek god Pan, which was the god of nature. And then Herod Philip said, well, we want to worship the emperor, and so he set up this place, and he named it Caesarea Philippi, Philippi after him, his name, Philip, but Caesarea to honor Caesar. Now, there was already a place called Caesarea. It's Caesarea by the sea, and so he had to have another name for it so that you didn't get confused. There are two Caesareas, so there's Caesarea by the sea, and if you go to Israel, you'll find it Caesarea Maritima. It's by the sea, and then there is way up north, Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus takes his disciples way up north for some R&R, &R, and this is a really critical, important time, and there's a an important discussion that he has with them. Verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. This is a key, key story. It's found in Matthew. It's found in Mark. It's found in Luke. And in this story, Jesus reveals his identity and he talks about the church. For the very first time, he speaks of the church. This is Matthew chapter 16, first time the word church is ever mentioned in the Bible, and it's mentioned here in Caesarea Philippi. Now, the question is, well, what does God want us to learn from this key passage of Scripture, from this important meeting there in an unlikely place, Caesarea Philippi? Three important truths. Truth number one, all human beings are born spiritually blind. That's a truth that comes out in this passage. All human beings are born spiritually blind. You say, where do you see that? Well, in the question Jesus asked them. He says to them, who did the people... He's been ministering now for two and a half years. He's been performing miracle after miracle. He's been preaching. He's been teaching. He's been doing tremendous wonders. Who do people say... The Son of Man is. Well, the disciples start talking. They say, well, some, some say you're John the Baptist. Herod, Herod uh, who was Antipas, Herod, the, the one Jesus called the fox, Herod who was there in, uh, in Jerusalem and tried Jesus along with Pilate, Herod said that he thought Jesus was John the Baptist risen from the dead. He was the one who had John the Baptist executed because his wife Herodias said, I want the head of John the Baptist. Give me the head of John the Baptist. And so he had John the Baptist executed, and he heard about Jesus, and he said, it's John. He has risen from the dead. Some say that Jesus was John the Baptist. Ah, wrong. Then others say, well, uh, some say you're Elijah. Ah, wrong. Well, some say uh, you're Jeremiah. No, thank you for playing. They didn't get that right. And, and then the others said, well, you're one of the prophets. No, wrong, 
Wrong, wrong, wrong, wrong. That's what people are saying. And they've watched Jesus and they've heard Jesus and they've seen the miracles that he's done and they all get it wrong on who Jesus is. Man can never understand on his own who Jesus is. It's impossible to understand because every human being born into this world is born spiritually dead, is born spiritually blind, and we're not going to be able to figure it out. Just like a blind person can't see the light, a spiritually blind person can't see the light either. There was a lady in our church. She's in heaven now. Many of you remember her, Estelle Merrill. Estelle Merrill was blind, and she was such a fun, wonderful lady, and she didn't let blindness, blindness stop her, and uh, she never uh, thought anything about joking, making some jokes about her condition. I remember she told me one time she said uh, that she couldn't sleep. Her husband could see, but Estelle was blind, and she couldn't sleep one night, so she went and she started doing some chores. And she was ironing like at 3 o'clock in the morning. She's ironing. Well, he wakes up. She's not there in bed. And so he goes to look for her. Well, he turns on the light in the kitchen, and there she is ironing. And he's like, well, what are you doing ironing in the dark? She said, well, I always iron in the dark. I'm blind. I don't think to turn on the light because it doesn't come on for me. And, you know, with a blind person, you turn on the light, it's still dark. And spiritually, every single person is blind. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see. He cannot see. And so man, with all that he can do to try and figure out who Jesus is, cannot figure it out. The religious leaders, this shows you how bad we are as human beings trying to figure things out on our own. The religious leader of Jesus' day when they saw Jesus do miracles and they heard his sermons, you know what they came up with? They said that this man casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Oh, that's what you came up with? Jewish religious leaders? That's you, you examine the life of Jesus and you say he's Beelzebul, the prince of the demons? I mean, you couldn't miss it by more. You, you are 180 degrees off of who Jesus is. Man can never understand on his own who Jesus is. Man must have illumination from God. So Jesus, who, does, who, who, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they give the wrong answer. They're just telling them what the people said. The people got it wrong. Verse 15, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? This is very personal, and this is very pointed. And Peter, speaking up, said, Thou art the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means son. Simon, son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to Peter. Flesh and blood cannot reveal that to Peter. Why? Because Peter's just like everybody else. He's spiritually blind. And when the Lord... Uh, comes and illuminates, then we can see. And the Lord illuminated the eyes of Peter spiritually so he could see, and that's how he made the declaration, you are the Christ. Man must have illumination from God in order to see, in order to make a decision. You've heard me say before, and it's not original with me. I heard it from Adrian Rogers, but it's so true. I can preach truth, but only the Holy Spirit can impart truth. Because unless the Holy Spirit illuminates your, your mind and your heart and opens your eyes to spiritual truth, you won't see it. And you'll be like Nicodemus. And when he's, Jesus said, you must be born again. Born again? Can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? How does that work? He missed it by a mile. He didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Why? Because his eyes were not open to the truth. We need illumination from God. And here's how it works. When you hear from the Lord, when you hear preaching, and, and if me or someone else preaches truth, and the Holy Spirit illuminates the truth, and your eyes are open to truth, then you have a decision to make. What are you going to do with that truth? Are you going to respond to that, or are you going to reject that? 
You know, when the Jews said that Jesus cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, their eyes were open to who Jesus was, and they said no to it. They did not want him. We will not have this man be ruler over us. That's what they said basically in their hearts. And the Lord told them, this is Matthew chapter 12, he told them when they said that, you cast out demons by Beelzebul, the, the prince, the ruler of the demons. He talked to them about the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is when God opens your eyes to truth, when God illuminates and turns on the light spiritually, and you see who Jesus is, and you say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. When we have the invitation, as we do in our church every week, and we're going to have one today, and I give the invitation and say, if you want to come and receive Christ, you come now. And some people, they, they feel the pull from the Lord, and they know they need to do this, and they know that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God, and God the Son, and they say, well, but yeah, but I don't want to do that, because then I'd have to walk down in front of people, and I, no, and they just, they just kind of dig their fingers into the pew, and they're, no, no, I don't want to do this, and they just wait, and the song is going, and they just wait, and wait, and wait, and God is pulling, and God is drawing, and they say, no, 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 it's a dangerous place to be a dangerous place to be. Why? Because no man can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent draws him. Jesus said that. No man comes to me except the Father who sent me draws him. And if God is drawing and you're resisting, there may come a point in time where God doesn't draw you anymore. And you can't get saved without the drawing of the Holy Spirit of God. All humans are born spiritually blind, and we need God to illuminate our eyes and the eyes of our hearts. Second truth, Jesus is building his church. Now, Peter, I mean, this was a home run shot. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because bl flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. You gave the right answer, Peter. Now, it wasn't out of your own heart. It's God that illuminated your eyes so that you could give the right answer, but the Lord blessed him. And then he says, and I say to you, verse 18, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overpower it, will not prevail against it. Now, many people look at Matthew 16, 18, and they say, well, you know, the Lord said that he was going to build his church on Peter. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And we have a denomination that says, well, you know, Peter's the first pope, and uh, the Lord's building on Peter, and they're all the, the, the next popes are all in succession of the line of Peter. That's not what he's saying. Now, I want you to see Matthew 16, 18, and I have two Greek words here for you to look at. Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros in the Greek, and upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. It's a different word. It's not the same word. The name Peter means rock, but, but Peter, Petros, means a piece of a rock. It, it, it's it's, a, it's a, like a hand-sized rock. It, it's, it, this is a rock. We could say this is a Petros. It is. It's a piece of a rock. It, it, uh, like prudential insurance, get a piece of the rock right here. And uh, Jesus isn't building on this. He's building on the Petra. I got a picture of a Petra. It's the rock of Gibraltar in the southern tip of Spain or toward the southern tip of Spain. That thing is huge. It's 1,400 feet, uh, almost, 1,398 feet uh, uh, tall, and it's just massive. It's one single limestone rock. That's a Petra. This isn't a Petra. This is a Petros. The Lord isn't building on Peter. He's building on himself. See, the church is not built on a good man. It's built on the God man, and that's a good thing. It's not built on a, on a man because a man, we talk about uh, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Peter's not a solid rock. I mean, we're going to read in just uh, in this same chapter. We know it's not Peter that he's talking about because in this same chapter, when the Lord starts saying that he's going to go to the cross and he's going to die and he's going to uh, be raised on the third day, 
Peter says, God forbid it, Lord, that this would ever happen to you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your sights on, man's, on, on God's interest, but man's. I mean, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, and then just a few verses, get behind me, Satan. Man, that's a big rebuke when the Lord Jesus Christ calls you Satan. And that's like, oh, man, I really didn't. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. I mean, that's big time. Peter messed up a lot. It's just going to be six months when Jesus goes to the cross, and we know about Peter when he denied three times that he even knew the Lord. The church is not built on Peter. The church is built on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the Son of God, he says, the Son of the living God. Now, some people will say, well, you know, he never said he was God. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of God and God the Son. The, the Jews understood that if you called yourself the Son of God, we're not talking about a Son of God, we're talking about the Son of God, the only begotten Son, that you're talking about God. And that's why you will see in the Bible the Lord Jesus Christ receiving worship. And he says, upon this rock, speaking of himself. That's important about the rock. Why? Because the rock illustration and analogy was used for God in the Old Testament. Look at some of these verses in Psalm 18. Psalm 18 verse 2 says this, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 18 31, for who is God but the Lord and who is a rock except our God? Psalm 1846, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. And then the Lord asks this question in Isaiah 44, verse 8. Is there any God besides me or is there any other rock? I know of none. He's the rock. You know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? He's talking about the children of Israel going through the wilderness, and they ate the same spiritual food, the manna, and they drank the same spiritual uh, drink that came from the rock. It says, because the rock followed them, and the rock was Christ. He is the solid rock. He is the Petra that the Lord said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And you say, well, okay, what, what exactly is the church? This is the first time it's used. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. It literally means the called out ones, the, the, the congregation, the assembly. That's what that word means. And ekklesia, called out, that, that, that has the word kaleo, which means to call. And so these are the ones that are called out to the Lord. And the church is really just the Lord's blood-bought congregation. That's what the church is. The congregation of the Lord, not people that have just come to quote-unquote church. You know, when we talk about church, there are two, uh, two different uh, views, on the, not views, but two different ways that word is used. First of all, we talk about our church. This is the church, First Baptist Church, Texarkana. This is the local church, our local church here in Texarkana. And the, when the Bible refers to church, sometimes it's referring to the local church. It, you know, in Revelation, you have the, the angel to the church in Ephesus, the angel to the church in Sardis, the angel to the church in Thyatira, in Philadelphia. You know, these different cities, there was a church. And so there are local churches, but then the Bible also speaks of the church universal. And when the Lord says, upon this rock I will build my church, he's not talking about uh, one local church. He's talking about the universal church. He's talking about all those who are part of his called out ones, his blood-bought congregation. Not people that signed a card, not people that uh, walked an aisle, not people that just uh, went in the waters of baptism. You know, all those things are good and great, but if there hasn't been a change in the heart, then none of that means anything. You know, it's like whoop-de-doo. You, you join this church, that church, the other church, and you've been baptized 10 times. That doesn't do it, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood 
as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And the church are those who have put their faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross, and they've been purchased by his blood. Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The blood of God. Church has been purchased with the blood of God. You said, I thought it was the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the blood of God because he's the God man. And to think that we were bought by the blood of the King of kings and Lord of lords. The song says, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Now, I want you to think about something when it comes to worth, because many people struggle with feeling worthless. You know, if, if you have a track record and, and a past where you have some deeds that you're very ashamed of and things that just make you feel uh, just so uh, bad about yourself and you feel so worthless, boy, the devil really will pick up on that. He'll beat you over the head to try and make you think you don't matter, you don't count. Look at all the things you did. You're a terrible, horrible person, a scum and a bum and a loser, and you start to feel like you don't have any self-worth. I want you to know something. When you think of worth, think of the worth of anything. Think of, I was trying to sell a car uh, a number of years ago, and it was a really nice car. And I said, man, this car, I should be able to get, you know, I've I've paid 18,000 for it. I've had it just about a year. I ought to be able to get, you know, 17,9. I mean, I thought, I thought I ought to be able to get a lot for it. It It's a really good car. And so I thought, no, nah, you know, seriously, that's 14000 14000 And somebody said, uh, yeah, I'll offer you, uh, I think he would offer me eleven. I said, that's insulting. He said, I'll offer you eleven. I said, well, I'll offer you to leave. I mean, I'm not taking eleven. I mean, you've insulted me. And uh, he said, okay. And so I was trying to sell it for fourteen. Call me back in a couple of weeks. He goes, you still got the car? I said, yes. He said, I'll offer you eleven. I said, I know your offer. It's not a good offer. I said, I'm going to sell it for 14. It's worth 14. He said, okay. Call me back in a couple weeks. Hey, I see that you still have the car for sale. I said, all right. How much will you pay? Well, 11. It's worth 14. You know what I learned about the car? It wasn't worth 14. Nobody was paying 14. It was worth 11. The worth of anything really has to do with what will someone pay? That's what it's worth, what someone will pay. What are you worth? The blood of God. That's what you're worth. That's what you're worth. You've been purchased by the blood of God, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the blood-bought congregation. It's those who say, yes, Lord, I want to know you. I want to come to you. I open up my heart to you. I say that I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I can't save myself. And you cry out with blind Bartimaeus, and you say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the moment you do, the Lord comes in, and your life is changed forever. You're bought with the blood of God. Jesus. Amen. That's the church. And he says that the church will never be overcome. That's the third truth. We're spiritually blind, all of us, when we come into this world, and Jesus is building his church, and the church will never be overcome. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the King James, and many of us uh, who grew up, you know, some time ago, uh, we've, we've heard the gates of hell shall not prevail against it because that's what was preached for so long. It was the King James Version. Now other versions have come out, and, and it doesn't say the gates of hell. It says the gates of Hades. And you say, well, what's the difference there? 
Well, the gates of Hades, gates has to do with authority. Because in the Old Testament, when you would conduct business, you would go to the city gates. The gates were a symbol of power and a symbol of authority. And so when the Lord says that the gates of Hades or the gates of hell shall not overpower the church, shall not prevail against the church, you can rest assured that the gates of Hades and hell are coming up against the church, but they're not going to overpower it. It's impossible for them to do that because the church is built on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the difference between Hades and hell? They're, they're similar, very similar. You know, Hades was, it's the place of the dead. It's the underground. It's also called Sheol, some people say. Sheol is a big, big place where all the dead are in Sheol before the Lord uh, died on the cross and rose again from the dead. When a person in the Old Testament died, they went to Sheol. Sheol has two compartments to it. You have paradise, which is the place of the righteous dead, and you have Hades, which is the place of the unrighteous dead. And it pictures the, the kingdom of the devil, and it pictures death. And so those two things are very critical. And I think what the Lord is saying here is, number one, the power of death can't stop the church. The power of death is not going to stop the church. And Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 16. He's speaking about his own death. He told the disciples in verse 21, from that time Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He's talking about his death. But the death of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't stop the church. Why? Because when he died, he said, it is finished. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And his death, coupled with his resurrection, broke the back of the enemy. And so we know that death doesn't stop the church. The Lord said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Death can't stop it. And the power of the devil can't stop it. So both those things are in line here because the devil is associated with Hades and the devil is associated with hell, and the Lord is saying all the powers of death and all the powers of hell can't stop the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the devil wants to stop the church. The devil tries to stop the church. You read the book of Acts, and you see how the devil comes up against the church, comes up against the church with persecution. We read in Acts chapter 7, you know, the, the gospel went out to Jerusalem and then all Judea and then Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. And we read that in uh, the, the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 7, it's kind of the conclusion of the gospel spreading into Jerusalem. It's the death of Stephen. And the Bible says that there was one there, Saul of Tarsus, and he was the one that kept the coats when they were stoning Stephen. Stephen, that great uh, preacher for the Lord. And they were stoning him. And Peter, or, or Saul, was there. And he was all glad that they were stoning Stephen. Yet yeah, throw another rock at him. Shut him up. And then it goes on to say in Acts chapter 8 that Saul was out to destroy. He was ravaging the church. And he was going from house to house and dragging people out of the house to put them into prison. He was breathing out, Acts chapter 9, verse 1, threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. There was great persecution in Acts chapter 8 against the church. And one of the principal persons that the devil was using to persecute the church was Saul of Tarsus. But then we read in Acts chapter 9, as he's on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians... He meets the Lord, and he falls on his face before the Lord, and he says, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And Saul, the blasphemer, the persecutor, the violent aggressor, becomes Paul, the greatest disciple that the world had ever seen. And the devil was using Saul of Tarsus, and God says, No more. And God appeared to Saul of Tarsus. The Lord Jesus appeared to him and opened his eyes to truth. And Saul of Tarsus responded to the light. And Saul of Tarsus' life was changed. That is why Paul refers to himself as the chief of sinners. 
because he tried to destroy the church. He was being used of the devil, and he didn't even know it, to try and destroy the church. But listen, death can't destroy the church, and all the powers of hell can't destroy the church. Nothing can destroy the church of the living God because it's built on Jesus. And you know, in the end of it all, the devil still comes at the Lord at the Battle of Armageddon to try and destroy the Lord and destroy his people, and the Lord comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, and all the artillery of the Antichrist is turned on Jesus, and he destroys them with a word, the sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. And the Bible says the carnage is so great that the blood splashes up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. The Lord is king and the Lord is victorious. And upon this rock, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, then he says one other thing. It's kind of interesting. I mean, it's exciting on verse 18. Wow, that's awesome. And then he says, and I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And people are saying, what exactly is that? It's, I guess Peter's the guy. He's at the gate. That's why we have all these jokes about Peter. I met Peter at the pearly gates because he's the guy with the key. You get in. Peter's not the only one with the keys to the kingdom. Peter was the one who unlocked the door to heaven, so to speak. It had already been unlocked because it says, whatever you bind on earth, literally, shall already have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall already have been loosed in, in heaven. But Peter was the one who preached on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 Jews were saved. And Peter was the one who was there when the uh, revival uh, was culminated through Philip's preaching, but then Peter came, and the Holy Spirit fell on the Samaritans. And Peter was the one who was there with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and the gospel went to the Gentiles. It was Peter who was initiating the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Lord allowed Peter to do that. But it's not just Peter. It's all of us who know Jesus, who are part of the blood-bought church. We have the keys of the kingdom, and we have the authority, and we have the privilege, and we have the responsibility of letting people know about an open door in heaven. You have been given the greatest message of all. I have been given the greatest message of all. What are we doing with the greatest message ever told? The song says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let me ask you, are you certain you're standing on the solid rock? Do you know for sure that you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and He really is living inside as Lord and Savior? If not, today can be the day for you. You can just pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me and for my sins. I believe that you rose again from the dead. I believe that you're God in the flesh. And right now, Jesus, I open the door of my heart Come into me, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray a prayer like that, turning from your sin and turning to the Savior, Jesus will save you, and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that. Just go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real